We're here in Brussels, Belgium, with Rafael Correa, president of Ecuador from 2007 to 2017, uh, one of the key figures in the pink tide of left-wing governments which rose up in Latin America in the 2000s. And in 2012, he gave asylum to the Australian journalist Julian Assange in the embassy in London, the Ecuadorian embassy. Thank you for, for being here, President. Your first question is about Julian Assange. He entered the Ecuadorian embassy in London in June 2012. What was your reaction when you first heard that he'd gone in and, and did you know him at that point? No, I was informed uh, through my foreign affairs minister that uh, Julian Assange has been has entered our embassy in London and of course we we started studying his case so after two months two months in August 20, 2012 we granted asylum to Julian Assange after two months of checking studying his uh, dossier. What did you discover when you looked at his that the case the Swedish case or, or, or the US pressure? There was no any any possibility for him in order to have a fair process. Yeah. That was not possible because there was too, uh, I, I refer to the United States, there was too many, too much uh, public pressure, government pressure, media pressure against him. And, and, and what about the UK role? When that happened uh, and he went into the embassy, what kind of pressure did the UK put on Ecuador? Well, I was not directly in charge of this affair for this reason, for that the government have a foreign affairs minister, was my foreign affairs minister, Ricardo Patiño. He was in contact with the British government, but of course, they, they are. <laughs> Historically, there were imperial powers, so they, they believe sometimes that they continue with this, perhaps, <laughs> with this power. Anyway, against us, uh, that doesn't work. And uh, yes, yes, they were very rude. They wanted to impose their laws, their criteria, etc., and we didn't accept that. We have, uh, as a sovereign country, the right to grant asylum to anybody without giving any explanation. But we gave explanation because we consider uh, uh, we uh, consider the the British government, the American government, the Swedish government. But we don't have to do that. For instance, I received a few months ago the political asylum from the Belgian government. It's just uh, half, a, half a page. So they don't have to give any explanation about that. But we, we did because, of, well, we, we, we believe that was convenient. But anyway, it's our, uh, as a sovereign country, it's our right. And am I right in saying that they threatened uh, initially to enter the embassy to get Assange uh, and break the rules? Yes, there was a moment where uh, British authorities threatened us that they will enter our embassy. But that was against the international right and uh, absolutely legal, but also silly, silly as well. Why? Because they have much more embassies around the world than we do. So if they, they, if they gave to, to the world such a bad example, the worst consequences will be against them because later, with any pretext, any reason, uh, nobody, uh, anybody could enter, invade in any country uh, their embassies. And, and while you're president, obviously um, the pressure increased from the Americans as well. Um, what was your foreign minister telling you, and what kind of pressure did you feel? from the Americans to, to give Julian Assange up. What were they, were they saying, we're not going to do certain deals with you? Were they saying that we would, we would draw for uh, support in certain ways, or was it not an issue? No, frankly, I don't remember that the American government threatened us. Like the British government, when they, if you want, uh, they said that they can enter our embassy, no? We didn't receive from the American government, as long as I remember, any threat like this. What should Britain have done if they were abiding by the law? They should have given Assange safe passage out of Britain to Ecuador. It's mandatory for any country to give the safe pass to, uh, to someone who has received political asylum. But it's a little bit different in the European uh, legal framework. Anyway, they could do that. 
they wa- they really want to do that. What do you think it does for Britain's reputation? What it's done in the Assange case, especially with how it dealt with Ecuador, because it. It didn't abide by the laws. It was rude, as you said, in negotiations. It didn't, to be honest, from the outside, it seems that they were never genuine about the negotiations. They were never going to let Assange get back to Ecuador. What has it done for Britain, Britain's reputation? Of course, they they are used to be obeyed, yes. <laughs> not to negotiate with a third world country, of course, with a Latin American country, with European country, uh, worldwide powers, uh, American government, etc. is a, is. A, is the other situation. But, uh, well, yes, uh, uh, there was not a symmetric negotiation, it was a symmetric relationship. They tried to, to, to deal with us like a subordinate country. Do you think that the, the, uh, the UK government is effectively just following orders from Washington? Do you think that's, uh, At least in coordination with Washington. And in terms of Assange, do you admire his work and and what, what do you think his work, his journalism has given the world? You know, I don't know uh, Julian Assange. I just talked one time because he was working for Russia Today and he, he, he made an interview with me for Russia Today. The only time when I talked to, by, by internet, by uh, video, with Julian Assange. I, I have never talked to him by telephone or to, to meet him in person. Uh, you know, if you want my honest uh, personal position, I don't agree with all the things that uh, Julian Assange did. Uh, but that is irrelevant. The, the main point here is that he didn't have any possibility to have a fair process, legal process, worst in the United States. So um, we had the... Absolutely, we had the sovereign right to grant it to, uh, to grant to Julian Assange a, a political asylum. And do you think um, that your position now, because you are currently here, you've been granted political asylum in Belgium, uh, that the, the Ecuadorian uh, authorities are seeking your extradition on bribery charges. Um, do you think that part of the, the, the pushback against you and the, the lawfare is about the, the stand you took on Assange? Of course, part of that. Because there, there, there is also the uh, hate from the elite. But it's a regional strategy, not just against me. It's against Lula da Silva, Evo Morales, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, uh, Fernando Lugo, Jorge Glasma, my vice president. So when you, you have this kind of regional strategy, there is no coincidence. No, it's a regional strategy. And, that can happen jo- uh, only if the American embassies in our countries are backing that. So it's not a coincidence. Anyway, of course, part of this uh, persecution, political persecution that I have received, I had received, is because of Julian Assange. Also, I canceled the, the, uh, the agreement in, uh, to have an uh, American base in our country. In 2009, I stopped that. Um, <laughs> these are things that uh, the American authorities uh, do not forgive, you know. But it's part of the problem. There is also the media hate, the elite hate, um, and to try to, to, to conserve, to, to, to maintain the status quo. We are a danger for the status quo. We are a danger for their privileges. Did any evidence of subversion by the U.S. Um, come out during your presidency? Was there, by the, I don't know, National Endowment for Democracy, different, different well, but Of course, this is a new strategy. Yes. It's very difficult to have, especially in South America, a military invasion from the United States. That is not possible. But there are more uh, fine, if you want, uh, ways in order to destabilize a government that they don't like. Mm-hmm. For instance, financing, uh, the uh, opposition uh, opponents groups, for instance, uh, ONGs, etc., and they receive this money, this financing from the National Endowment for Democracy that everybody knows is the financial branch of the CIA. And, and just to go back to Assange, uh, what do you think the US and the British want him want to do with him? 
Do they want him dead? Do they want Julian Assange? Yeah. They, would, they gonna kill him? Gonna be free again? They, they, gonna... they are destroying him. Yeah. They already destroy him. My lawyer and we uh, we are having this uh, interview in the my lawyer's office in Brussels. Well, he's also Julian Assange lawyer, and he can tell you that he's absolutely destroyed as a human being. So he already or they already destroy Julian Assange. Uh, what they uh, what they can, uh, want to do is a uh, effecto demostración. How do you say in English? Uh, make, a, make, a, make an example. Make a, an example of Julian Assange. You can see uh, what happened with someone who uh, who dared to reveal our secrets. But what secrets Julian Assange revealed? War crimes. We have to thank him. Instead of that, they are killing him. And do you think that he will ever be free again? Or do, do, you think that, do you think they'll let him? I am very pessimist. I don't think so. And in they, they want to, uh, to make an example from Julian Assange. What, to send a message to journalists around the world that you don't... Uh, you don't, you you don't cannot read. pass these red lines. You cannot uh, uh, deal with us. You cannot uh, reveal our crimes. In terms of the, the diplomatic cables which were released, started being released in 2010, was that quite important for not just Ecuador, but for a lot of countries in Latin America because it revealed the specifics of how the US was trying to undermine progressive governments. You know, uh, I realized very well, I have been president during 10 years, that uh, countries must have confidential information. Mm. But uh, <laughs> there are limits. You cannot hide war crimes. And even more, you, have, you can find here, here a double standard. Why? Because strictly speaking, Julian Assange didn't publish the information. The information was published by the New York Times, by the Spiegel in Germany, by the Pais in, in Spain, the Guardian in UK. Why they are not uh, be, uh, being punished, being persecuted? Because they are the strong part of the chain. They selected the uh, weakest part of the chain, Julian Assange. Now, your embassy in London was, I imagine, the most surveyed um, and, uh, building you know, or, or apartment in the whole world um, for years. Did you worry about your staff there? Yes, um, of course. Their mental health, their, their, their safety? We was know, like? we knew that moment there, and we know, we continue to know, that we, we were under surveillance. And even more, we engaged a special security company in order to, to protect the embassy, to protect Julian Assange. It was called uh, UK, uh, no, UK, no, uh, UC Global. UC Global, sorry, from Spain. And they betrayed us. They sold the information to the CIA. They were, uh, they were uh, engaged, if you want, captured by the CIA. What's quite striking from an outsider's perspective is how it's only Latin American leaders that have been supportive of Julian Assange. This is a global press freedom issue for every single person on planet Earth. Recently, you would have seen that AMLO, uh, the president of uh, Mexico, is, has, has made a big issue of Assange. He talks about him in his presidential conference. Apparently, he gave a letter to President Biden after meeting him, saying, please free him. Um, why is Latin America the only, the, and the progressive leaders in Latin America, why are they the only ones that are leading this, this vital cause for press freedom? I don't have an answer for that. And I am surprised, shocked, because uh, Assange was betrayed by journalists around the world, by governments around, around the world, by his own government, Australian government. You know, if we had an Ecuadorian citizen suffering this kind of uh, pressures, uh, persecution, uh, illegal situation, we have the, our duty is to defend it, him. But the Australian government doesn't care. So I don't have an answer for your question. And just in terms, I, I, I forgot to mention this because, but it's quite important. There was a, an article that came out last year, I don't know if you saw it, it was 30 former US officials went on a record saying that the CIA had been asked to draw up assassination plans for Assange in London. Did you see that? Yes, yes, I, oh, um, I saw did that. Did that shock you? Of um, course, but that, that shock, but uh, that uh, didn't surprise me. 
really? because we are used to that, you know. This is the Latin American history. And do you think that that's essentially, that's the end goal, is to have him dead? It's difficult to answer that question, I don't know, but anyway, one thing is very clear. For the American government, Julian Assange is an enemy, and he has destroyed that enemy, at least to destroy his freedoms, his reputation, and perhaps his life. The, with all due respect, the British judicial system freed Pinochet during the 90s when he was requested by a Spanish judge because, of kill, uh, because the, the killing of several Spanish citizens. I don't know if Julian Assange has killed somebody. Anyway, I don't know what crime commit Julian Assange. So why such a persecution, such a desire to destroy Julian Assange's life? It's very difficult to understand that. When you step down as president, <clears throat> your vice president, uh, Lenin Moreno, won the election and then very swiftly cozied up to the Americans, reversed a lot of your domestic policies. What was that about? Do, wh who was Lenny Moreno? Do, do you think that there was something uh, sinister um, about his, that he was uh, compromised when he was your vice president or maybe soon after? Uh, we believe the, one of the most, uh, most uh, one of the strongest hypotheses, uh, Lenny Moreno is a corrupted. We realize very well now that we didn't know that moment there. So, but now we, we know that he he had a secret account in Panama, et cetera, et cetera. We have the number, we have, we have everything. So perhaps American government knew that before us and they put under control Lenny Moreno. Otherwise it's very difficult to, to understand what was the switch of Lenin Moreno from the, from, from our uh, political program, progressive program, etc., to the far right program, and to be absolutely subordinate to the United States. Uh, one proof of that, just one week after Lenin Moreno took office, he already received Paul Manafort, the campaign chief of uh, Donald Trump. And he offered him, he, uh, Lenin Moreno offered uh, to Paul Manafort to give to the American government, Julian Assange, to give back Julian Assange to the American government. And you can find that in the testimonies that uh, 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 were uh, requested for the case against Paul Manafort because he, he was condemned for corruption. You have several testimonies. Uh, among the, uh, those testimonies, people who were in this meeting in Ecuador, in the presidential palace, one week after, Lenin Moreno took office. So that moment there, he was negotiating with Julian Assange already. And, and do you think in terms of how the US is operating in Latin America now, are they still, are we still in a sort of Operation Condor years of coups or is it done in different ways? Can you talk about how the subversion of progressive leaders like yourself, Lula, Evo, Morales happens now? You know, with the lefty government arriving to the region, they don't have uh, another plan condor, not because they don't want to, do, <laughs> to have uh, again that, because they cannot have again that. It's too evident. But they try, they have other strategies, the uh, finest strategies, strategies, for instance, to destabilize uh, progressive governments, uh, sovereign governments, leftist governments, you want, through the, this ONG finance by the National Endowment for Democracy uh, to try to destabilize progressive government through the media, telling lies, manipulating, etc., financing uh, uh, the opponents of the progressive governments and uh, trying to, to create unrest against among the population against the progressive government. So there are a lot, a cocktail of new measures in order to try to attack progressive governments. But is it working? That's the question, because you have Colombia, the first left-wing president yes. ever. You have Chile, you have... Um, uh, Peru, Peru, Bolivia, exactly. Argentina. Peru, in Bolivia, they reversed. In uh, Brazil, uh, Lula yeah. da Silva will win. So yeah, there, there's a, there's a, there is a, a kind of pink tide 2.0 happening. 
So it does seem like the, the CIA, the Americans, aren't, aren't winning in Latin America. Is that fair? You know, if you ask me, uh, the foreign policy, American foreign po po uh, policy towards Latin America is very silly because they try to stop, for instance, migration. They can build all the walls they want. They're gonna, in this way, they will not stop migration. How can they stop migration? And the same thing for Europe, from North Africa, etc., trying to improve uh, life conditions in this region, for instance, in Latin America. For this reason, you need, in Latin America, social justice. We have a continent very unfair, very unjust, very unequal. So, but when there is a government trying to do that, well, the, this government will be attacked by, by the United States. If you, if, you don't, if you are not a liberal government, the American government believes that you are against them. No, we are trying to find our own solutions for our own problems, our reality, for our reality. And in terms of Ecuador and your situation, what, what does the future hold for you? I mean, can you go, will you be able to go back ever if they, if they have this, it's a, it's a 10 year prison sentence. Isn't Eight it? years prison, Eight years. you for, know. For a payment of $6,000 apparently. One of the proof is that I received 6000 <laughs> Dollar that was a credit huh? <laughs> from a common fund that we had at the presidency. They, they said that, that there was there was bribes. They were bribes. Anyway, uh, six thousand dollars. They put putting my personal account in a public bank, but they they had nothing. It's just a setup against us. Uh, they condemned me because they didn't have any proof against me because of. Influencia psíquica en Spanish. Psíquica, psíquic influence en inglés. Psíquic influence. That that is the sentence. Psíquic influence. Hours before, I I should register myself as candidate to run in the last election. In this way, they prevented me to return to my country. They prevented me to be candidate, and they made Lasso president. They are not just stealing our reputation, our feeling, our stability. They are stealing our democracies. But because all these attacks are against lefty leaders, nobody cares. It's the same that happened with Lula, isn't it? With Lula, the same with Lula. Lula was put in jail. Yeah, exactly. And in this way, they prevented Lula to be candidate, and they make Bolsonaro a fascist. Right? Bolsonaro president of Brazil. In terms of the, so the US, we hear a lot about in Latin America. Um, do, did, you have, did you come across any kind of British role uh, in Ecuador specifically? Were there, did you have good relations with Britain when you, were, when you were president? We try to have very good relationship with any country in the world, but in a framework of mutual respect. Mm. But it's clear that <laughs> UK <laughs> uh, disrespect that you want a country like Ecuador. There was not just the case of Julian Assange. Exactly. There were other cases. For instance, once, year 2008, 2009, I don't remember quite well, <laughs> the British ambassador called me and told me that Prince Charles with Camila came to the country to visit Galapagos no? in vacations, to visit as tourism to visit our Galapagos Island, and we were very honored of having Prince Charles and Camilla. But the British <laughs> ambassador <laughs> not just tell me, told me, but ordered me to receive Prince Charles on Sunday. And I told him, come on, ambassador, Sunday day is my family day. I work from Monday until Saturday. I try to to, to dedicate my Sunday, to my Sundays, to my family. No, no, on Sunday. But he's coming in vacation. So he can, uh, we can receive him on Monday. We have a very nice ceremony at the Presidential Palace uh, every Monday, El Cambio Guardia, the, the Presidential Guard. Uh, they, they changed the Presidential Guard. It was a very beautiful ceremony. We can invite Prince Charles with Camila. There are a lot of Ecuadorian people. Uh, in the Central Park in front of the Presidential Palace. He can uh, say hello to, to the Ecuadorian people. No, no, on Sunday, on Sunday. 
Finally, I sent my vice president to receive Prince Charles and Camila. And I, I realized very well that <laughs> they didn't forgive me because the ne next year I had to go to London. I was invited by London School of Economics and another, uh, other universities in order to, to give some conferences and nobody received me as president of Ecuador. Nobody received me at the airport in London. I interviewed Evan Morales a couple of months ago, and he. I asked him about the British. He said that they have a still have a colonial mindset. Yes, would you, yes. Would you that's agree very with that? clear. Yeah. Yes. No. No. Evo is absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and just in terms of what you did, and it, the, it, Ecuador was was more radical than most of the models. So was Evo Morales and and Hugo Chavez. Trying to uh, extricate yourself from an economic system of exploitation. So there's many different elements of that. But one interesting one is um, Siadi, or that's in Spanish, but we call it Ixid in English. Can you just talk a little bit about, about how, because you, Ecuador was hit with a, one, with a huge, Occidental Petroleum won a huge... And Chevron. And Chevron, yeah. So how does, how does this system work to keep... Um, um, governments within a, a, a straitjacket. Transnational enterprises have more rights than uh, human beings in our region. For instance, if you have an aggression attack against human beings, they have first to go through the whole national judicial system, and after that, just after that, you can uh, go to the inter-American system, and it can take uh, 20 years uh, to, res to solve your case, and a case against human rights. But any transnational enterprise, without going to, to any judicial step in our countries, can directly, uh, how can you, uh, can you say in English, directly process, if you want, a sovereign state in these uh, international tribunals, Siad in, in Spanish, and also the United Nations Tribunal in La Haya. From a position of being a president for 10 years of a country that's trying to escape that system, that's one part of it, but there's obviously many others, debt, IMFs, loans, all these different. How, how, how hard is it to escape that system? Uh, do they set it up so you can't leave? But I, I don't know if you, you, you are aware that before becoming president, all my life I was professor. Yeah. And I am an economist. I am the first economist as president in Ecuadorian history. And I knew very well all that. There is not uh, evidence, there is not a relationship between to sign all these treaties. Uh, you want uh, uh, renouncing, renouncing are your sovereignty, are your capacities as a state, there is, no, there is no relationship between this kind of treaties and more foreign investment. In order to attract foreign investment, we need foreign investment, but right? that is not the right way. Foreign, foreign investors don't go to countries that are good students of the IMF or the, that they are signing up these kind of treaties. Foreign investors go, go, will select with choice countries with good economic policies, with good investment opportunities, with a very clear uh, a framework, legal framework, etc. And what, that was exactly we, what we tried to do. Okay. Yeah, because in Brazil, they never signed up to exit, and they don't have a problem with uh, foreign direct investment, do they? There is not any no. statistical evidence no. about that. But. Um, La uh, am I right in saying that last year Ecuador rejoined ICSID? Yes, of course, after my government, yeah. because of the uh, Moreno betrayal, uh, we had now the far right governments in place and they are signing everything, you know, yeah. everything. They're reintegrating Ecuador. But because system. they are not defending the common good, uh, the common good, they are defending their own interest and they have very strong relation with these uh, uh, transnational enterprises. So just in terms of what you've been talking about with um, your successor, Lenin Moreno, what kind of um, uh, reputational damage has he done to Ecuador? Especially in the Assange case, Ecuador was kind of a beacon for press freedom around the world. Maybe not in London and Washington, but around the world, uh, outside of the propaganda systems within the, the Western capitals, 
uh, Ecuador was hugely respected for protecting a journalist that was being persecuted by powerful countries. When La Morena comes in, now the, the abiding image is the British police pulling this journalist outside of the Ecuadorian embassy. It's, it's very evocative and, it, and it's hard to, it will be hard for Ecuador to shake that reputational damage. Can you just talk a bit about it? The country was humiliated. Nobody else will trust a Latin American country in order to, to look for a political asylum. The, the damage is huge. It's huge and lasting. And even more, uh, it's against our constitution. You can see the article 41 of our constitution. Huh? It's uh, explicitly prohibited, uh, explicitly, uh, this, this article explicitly prevents to, to give to the persecutors uh, someone persecuted. So he broke our constitution, but <laughs> there is no problem as long as you are <laughs> you are acting according to the United States government or according to the media, the elites, e and against Korea. That is the, uh, perhaps uh, the most important point. So yes, the country was accumulated and the damage is huge and lasting. And what, do you, what did he get in return for that? What did Moreno get in return from the US because for giving our son up? Of course, there was coordination with the American government, but also uh, they wanted to, to attack us. To, to, to show that we, we made the, the wrong decisions or that we uh, didn't act uh, in a right way. So it was a lot of uh, political, internal uh, political factors as well. And the irony is that after Moreno took over, you were attacked for being attacking the media and, and closing down dissent. But then your vice president, Jorge Glass, was put in prison until yes. quite recently, right? And he was journalist too. Huh? He's an engineer, but he, uh, he, he had a TV program, etc. Yes, yes. Uh, so they are persecuting all, of, all the members of my government. Do you think that there's anything that you... Have they tried to reverse your whole program? Have they been able to reverse the whole program of your government? Always something rest, and that is our hope. For instance, now we have a, a very high uh, popular support in our country. For the reason they, <laughs> with all the energies, will continue trying to uh, prevent my return to my country. We have, uh, by far, we are the most important political movement in political party in my country, in Ecuador, and um, uh, myself, the, the most important political leader, if you want. Anyway, um, why that happened after five years of persecution? Because something, the, the facts are there. They can, they can mislead some people during some time, but not all the people do the, all the time. So people realize very well how the, their conditions of life have, have changed. Uh, how uh, were these uh, wonderful years of my government during, from 2007 until 2017? So people is not silly. They are not silly. They can compare right now. For this reason, we, they, can, they couldn't destroy us because people can compare. In terms of the future for Latin America, for the left, are you hopeful? Yes, of course, always, always. Yeah. Something is still there, even in Ecuador, even after five years of persecution. And you can see, no? uh, there was a, if you want a conservative restoration from 2014, but again, the second progressive wave is coming. Mm -hmm. In Chile, in Peru, Honduras, mm -hmm. Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, Colombia, something incredible. Colombia is a miracle. So, you know, it's not just uh, ideology because we want to do that. No, it's because of reality. If, you, if we want to change two centuries of underdevelopment, we have to try something different, not to continue to doing the same things. And just on that, because it seems to, from the outside that whatever you think of the Chinese government or the Russian government, it's better for independent governments like your, your one was, or like Evo Morales or Hugo Chavez, to have a multipolar world because- But of course. That, that the US can't interfere so much if, you, if there's another pole you can organize around. Is that true? 
Well, we are not uh, power powerful enough in order to change the world no, 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 wide no, no. order. I'm but that you can, you can, go, you can, you can if, you, if there's more options, with who you can to, with, Of uh, course, exactly. the more options, the better for us. Exactly. It's always very risky to depend on just one country mm -hmm. because that is not cooperation, it's dependency, mm -hmm. you know? And that, that doesn't mean to, to be against a, 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 the American people, the American government. That is a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. And a, they always make the mistake. If you, if you do not uh, privilege the American relationship, you are against them. Mm -hmm. Come on. I study in the United States. I live there, very happy years. I admire American people. Mm -hmm. But we have to, to look the better for our people too. And the more options, the better. Okay. Always in a mutual respect framework with the United States, with Europe, with Russia, with China. Did you feel you were treated differently by China and Russia than you were by the United States? Or was it the same sort of um, relationship? Of course, we had a very close relationship with China. With, we were an example for the region because he, <laughs> China is the uh, most important, the biggest finance finances in the world. They are financing the United States themselves. No? So, uh, and we need finance for development. So, uh, when I was a Minister of, fin of Public Finance in 2005, I announced this. It's strategically, it's very important for us to, to become closer to China because they need hydrocarbons. We are exporters of oil. And we need <laughs> financing for our development to build hydroelectrics, to build roads, etc. And what that was exactly what I did when I was when I became president. But in order to be closer to China, doesn't mean to be against the uh, United States. But sometimes they believe that, and of course, the Latin American elites that perhaps they speak Spanish, but they think in English. <laughs> uh, they use also this situation in order to try to, 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 to break the relationship uh, against the uh, United States. I mean, what it seems like is that the US is not happy if a government is a sovereign, independent, and makes its own decisions. It might be that it... And also if they have uh, uh, competition in order to control the region, according to their beliefs. Mm -hmm. For instance, now they, there are a lot of pressures in order to prevent China to continue uh, if you want financing and working in the in Latin American region, there there is a very very aggressive uh, foreign uh, foreign policy, American foreign policy, in order to prevent China to continue working with uh, Latin American countries. And you're saying that as president, you 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 close down the U.S. base or the prospective base at Mantel, right? Yes. Um, and you you gave. Asylum to Assange, and you're saying that you didn't feel any pressure from the U.S. in terms of the U.S. ambassador didn't say you, you need to stop doing They didn't dare to do that. They, they knew didn't. very well, they realized very well what uh, government, what president they, they had in Ecuador that moment there. We expelled from the country an uh, American ambassador oh, did you? in order to mix up with, because of, uh, to, to, he was involved in pol internal political affairs. So we, we expelled her because it was a, it was a woman. And then she come, it's a new one in place now. We didn't have ambassadors because they expelled our, right. <laughs> our ambassador too. After that, we didn't have ambassador during a while. And later, well, we normalized the, the bilateral relationship. I just wanted to ask about the current war in Ukraine just and the role of NATO. Uh, what's your opinion on, on, on that conflict? I, I do not agree with the Russia aggression against Ukraine, but I, I am not going to, to make the mistake of to divide the world in good people, nice people, and bad guys. No, come on, it's too, too naive. Huh? I don't, do not agree with war. I don't, do not agree with Russia invasion, but uh, Come on, how many invasions uh, American government uh, has made? How many invasions with the, without the, the approval of the United Nations? NATO, is, uh, United States, etc. So I think that there is a double standard and we, I, myself, cannot agree with this kind of situation. 
And I wanted to ask about um, Venezuela. Is it right that you're advising the, the yes. Venezuelan government? Yes, the economic advice yeah. of. Um, now, they have been subjected to serious uh, subversion. Um, and I Venezuela have, is a country in war. Yeah, and exactly. You have to be aware of that. Yes, exactly. And, and for years. Yes. Um, why do you think the US is so keen to see the removal of the Maduro government? Well, two, perhaps two reasons. First, they had a very strong socialist uh, system. And, well, the American government uh, will take as an enemy any government uh, with a s so different system from the liberal, liberal American system. And secondly, because of the natural resources of the Venezuela. Venezuela has the biggest uh, reserve, oil reserve in the world. One of the biggest gas reserves. So for, for, <laughs> for a strategic reason for the United States, that is very important. And is the, is the, situ is the economic situation in Venezuela improving now? Improving, but it's very bad. It's still, it's still very bad. We, we will not uh, mislead ourselves, but they must be broken. They should be broken, should be destroyed, and they are surviving, and they are improving. And from your analysis, your economic analysis, how much of the, um, the trouble there in terms of the economy is down to mismanagement by the, the Venezuelan government, and how much is down to the subversion, the sanctions? Any government makes uh, mistakes. That is not a problem. The problem is the embargo. The problem is the blocks. Uh, the 95% of the economic terrible situation of Venezuela is because of the American embargo, illegal American embargo. Uh, can you imagine? Venezuela cannot sell its uh, oil. By far, the most important export product cannot sell. No? The government cannot sell the, the, the oil. Can you imagine if Chile uh, could not sell its copper? It's going to be in bankruptcy six months later. Venezuela has resisted this situation how, how long? Six, seven years? And it continued to survive and continue to improve. Are relations improving now because of the Ukraine crisis and the fact that Russian oil is not going to be as freely available? Uh, are, are the US trying to get closer to or trying to stop the various uh, war by another name that they're, they've been enacting? Now? You know, American government doesn't have eternal principles. They have eternal interests. So now that I realize that because of the Russian invasion to Ukraine, oil prices are <laughs> very high. They tried to, uh, and in fact, they already sent a commission to deal with Venezuela and to try to get the Venezuela oil. I followed closely what you did, what your government did in Ecuador and the progressive reforms and moving the country forward. Uh, and every time I would discuss it, so someone on the left would always say, yeah, but his, 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 his government's really bad on indigenous rights, number one, and they'd say it's very extractivist. Can you just, um, as those were the two issues, what's, what's your take on that? And what, what, why was that? You know, why were they the two um, attack lines? That came Matt, from? first of all, I am an academic guy. I, I do not mislead myself. I can show you technical indicators saying, showing without any doubt that... Uh, we were a very successful government. We were one of the most successful countries in the region and in the world during 2007 until 2017, for instance. We, we were the regional champion reducing inequality. inequality. We were the, the regional champion reducing poverty, etc. At, uh, about advancing the educational system, etc. Infrastructure, roads. But uh, there is a lot of <laughs> misinformation for Europe. And that is a, a problem. It's sometimes we, we, we create might about, for instance, indigenous uh, people. I work, part of my life I work with indigenous people. Uh, one of my government most important things, goal, uh, goals were to, to, to to finish centuries of exclusion for indigenous people. But that doesn't mean that they have their right all the time, that they uh, are just good guys. And for instance, the, 
the indigenous leadership was an ally of the opponent to my government, trying to destabilize my government every time. They have to, to to think if they want to live in a democratic system because we won the elections and two months, three months later, they want to change the political program winner in, in the election, that, that won the election for theirs, that, uh, that was defeated. So that is not democratic. And extractivism, that is crazy. You know, we were very careful about uh, social and environmental issues, but we need our natural resources in order to, to finish poverty, in order to get developed. I, as an economist, realized very well that. So, and we, we did that in an extremely democratic way because I was very clear during my campaigns, we're gonna use our oil, our gold, our mining sector in order to get resources to finish poverty, to get developed, etc. And we won almost with 60% of the popular vote. But three months later, they wanted to stop all that. That is not democratic. So, and we had a principle to use the extractivism to get out from the extractivism. And that means to use these resources to excellence, uh, in, mobilize these resources, for instance, to, uh, to other uh, sectors, for instance, in human talent, uh, scholar, uh, scholarships, uh, yeah. scholarships. Yeah. See, yes. <laughs> I, 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 I am tired. Yeah, Scholarships, yeah. Uh, infrastructure, etc., uh, to develop other uh, other sectors. That is uh, to overcome. That is the way to overcome extractivism, not the the naive way of closing the oil exploitation, the mining sectors. In this way, after a few months, we will be in bankruptcy. So I'm interested in the Ecuador model. Did you, because obviously like Evo, Evo Morales' model and, 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 Chavez, and Chavez as well was, was based on nationalization. Did you nationalize hydrocarbon and mining assets or not? No, but you know, I respect a lot what Evo Morales did in Bolivia. It's incredible what he did. But a modern left has other ways also to obtain the same results. For instance, we renegotiate the oil contracts with the transnational companies. Before this renegotiation with the original contracts that I received from former governments, 80% of the oil income uh, stayed with the company and 20% went to the, to the country. With the renegotiation, we changed this relation. 80% for the country, 20% for the company. Do you feel that transnational companies are now more powerful than the nation states? Or the smaller yes, of course, there is a, there is a transnational uh, company that are stronger than our states, some states like Ecuador. For instance, Chevron. Mm -hmm. You can see the budget of Chevron. We have a problem with Chevron. It contaminates it contaminate our uh, rainforest, but it's very clear. Mm -hmm. you, you can visit uh, the Amazon region and you can put your hand and the hand will be very dirty because of the oil spilled by, spelt, no? spilled. spelled by Chevron. But uh, we lost the lawsuit, the international lawsuit against Chevron because they had much more money in order to, to, to defend themselves. And uh, a huge uh, campaign for public relations, uh, a lot of media under control, a lot of relation, public relations agencies, etc. So of course, some transnational companies are stronger than our, state, our states. From a personal perspective, you looking at the situation in Ecuador now, you had such a, so hopeful what happened there, you know, under your presidency. And then it's, it's such a, such a reverse of that. And so many advances stopped and reversed. And yes, also it's, it's, a terrible it's, situation. It's a now, tragedy. How does it make you feel? For me, it's very hard. For me, it's very hard. It's very sad, very disappointing, but it happened. We have to continue fighting in order to re recover the country. Do you hope that one day you'll be president again? Is that your aim? No. It's to recover the, the country for our people, for Latin America, for the progress, for the prosperity, for the social justice, for everybody. 
Do you think this government will last till the next election, or there will be an early election? When when is the next election? In two thousand. Well, that uh, that depends. Local elections, two thousand twenty-three. National elections, two thousand twenty-five. So, do you think this government will last till two thousand and twenty-five, or because it looks like it's a fluid? I don't know, but it's a very weak uh, government. Is a complete failure, and it must, it should be put away because uh, we have in our constitution a democratic uh, solution for this situation. Uh, Lasso, the actual president, is in, uh, involved in corruption cases. For instance, Pandora Papers. He mislead everybody. He promised everything and he delivered nothing. And he's an absolutely failure. Uh, with us, with my government, Ecuador was the second safest country in Latin America. Now is one of the uh, more unsafe, unsafest countries in the region. So people cannot live in the country. They, 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 they fear, they, they really, it's, it's not a good life. So uh, we have to, to find a democratic solution for this problem. And we had this democratic solution in the constitution is to advance elections or to put uh, to to have a, a referendum to decide if the government can continue or not. But they are stopping all this because they want to continue in power. They don't care about the country. They they care about to continue in office, and they are destroying the country. In terms of your analysis of your own presidency, because obviously a lot has, a lot has changed since then. Um, uh, do you do you think you made any big mistakes which led to this kind of to your legacy being disrupted in such a way? I mean, one obvious mistake will, will probably would be Lenin Moreno being your vice president, but 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 you didn't know at that time. But what how what would you have done differently to stop this this happening? With, or or was it inevitable? As I mentioned before, any government makes mistake, but if you want to, we didn't make huge mistakes. The strategic vision, the goals, were absolutely right. Of course, the tactics, the methods, the, some decisions could be wrong. But the big lines, the big direction was absolutely right. And the, the inter, one of the major important things that you did uh, alongside your colleagues in Bolivia and, and Venezuela and other places was moved to integrate Latin America to yes. CELAC and UNASUR yes. and others. Can you just talk about why that's so important and why and, and, and who who is pushing the other way? Who's pushing you to be all separated? If you compare if you compare the United States history with the Latin American history, you can see why they were so successful and we cannot reach Yet the development, because from the beginning, they uh, united itself. There were 13 English colonies at the beginning, British colonies, and they continued together as just one country. <laughs> Quite the opposite in Latin America, instead of trying to consolidate uh, the different countries, we didn't conserve the political uh, Spanish division. And for instance, Gran Colombia became three countries. Central American republics became five countries because it, everybody wanted to, to have a country for himself. So that was a huge mistake. Anyway, Mexico, Brazil are very huge countries. So that, that means that size is not enough to be developed. No, and not necessary to be developed. Singapore is a very little country, very small country. And it's a developed country, but it's very desirable to have a, a bigger size. And for this reason, Latin American countries should uh, unify themselves. Following the example of European Union, you know, and for us should be much easier because you were 28, now 27 <laughs> because of the Brexit. Uh, countries uh, with different languages, with different cultures, with different political systems, uh, killing themselves, each other, 
eh, some decades ago, in Latin America we have the same, the same religion, the same uh, uh, econo uh, political system, the same culture, the same language. So for us, it should be much easier to unify the region. But we didn't have the conviction, we didn't have the, the decision. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. I took up a lot of your time. I appreciate it.